This is the Wednesday, March 15, 2023, afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Aria, please call the roll. Rubio? Here. Ryan? Here. Gonzalez? Here. Matt? Legal afternoon. Here. Now we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered when testifying. State your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you're a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifying, testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you very much. First up this afternoon is a report, item number 222, please. Accept the Portland Design Commission 2022 State of the City Design Report. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. It's a pleasure to introduce the 2022 Portland Design Commission State of the City Design Report. The first item of business is to thank the dedicated volunteers who serve on the commission. This commission meets for many hours, two, or three, two to three Thursday afternoons a month as they review land use cases and provide design advice. They are a dedicated, hardworking group that include Brian McCarter, who is our chair, Vice Chair Chandra Robinson, Julie Livingston, Don Balaster, Jessica Molinar, Sam Rodriguez, and Zari Santner. Thank you all for your dedication and service to our city. Now, this commission will be presenting their 11th report before council, but they will have been operating in the city of Portland since circa 1980, providing leadership and expertise on urban design and architecture and on maintaining and enhancing Portland's historical and architectural heritage. The premise of this 2022 State of the City Design Report is how and why design review matters in Portland now. The Design Commission will present an overview of how design review has influenced the very fabric of our pedestrian-oriented city for the past 40 years. We have built a walkable, vibrant, diverse, and easily accessible central city that is admired by the world for its planning and design innovation. The Design Commission will explain why now, more than ever, the application of Design Review's three design tenets, one, context, two, public realm, and three, quality and permanence, is so critical to not losing our city's livability for all who live, work, and play here. I look forward to hearing more from the commission members and interested public, and I'm committed to supporting the commission on all of its efforts. Design Commission Chair Brian McCarter, will you please share with the council the Portland Design Commission's 2022 State of the City Design Report? We invite you up here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. 
for this uh, opportunity. Um, I'm going to give a little overview of what we'll talk about today. We're going to introduce my colleagues, and one of, one of them is uh, patching in remote, Zary Santner. Uh, we'll quickly look at where we work in the city and the design zones, or the tools we use, uh, a refresher on the citywide design guidelines that this council approved in 2021, and how those were uh, applied to a really great project in Lentz that we'd like to show you that's uh, we're actually going to be our project of the year. Um, Don is going to review a little bit about how design review has worked over the decades. Uh, and then we're going to look at, we're concerned about the state of downtown and how design commission can not be in the way but actually support the efforts that many are doing right now. And so we'd like to talk about that a little bit. And then I'll circle back in with some uh, things on our to-do list for the next year that we want to uh, get done. and get accomplished. And then we're going to have a couple testimonials. Um, one, Alex Yale from YBA, and then Tim Eddy is going to uh, talk to us remotely. So uh, just a little brief bio. Chandra Robinson to my right here, uh, vice chair of our commission. She's also a principal architect at Lever Architects. Zary Santner, uh, who's dialing in remote, is a, oh, Sorry, I keep looking up there. She's a retired landscape architect, was uh, the director of Portland Parks and Recreation, and she's also a mem member of uh, Regional Arts and Culture Council. Sam Rodriguez, uh, to my left, um, is also a past chair. He's an architect and vice president for Mill Creek Development, and they've done a lot of work in Central City. Jessica Molinar is not with us today. She had a conflict. She's a senior designer at Brick Architecture. Julie Livingston, Livingston is uh, Chair Emeritus. She's an architect and a senior uh, manager for Home Forward, which is a developer of affordable housing. And then Don Vallister is a longtime Portland architect and partner in, uh, retired now, but a partner in Vallister Coral Architect and also a, a part-time developer. Julie. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, the slide in front of you is a slide of the design zones within the city of Portland. Uh, it, You'll be perhaps surprised to know that design review is not applied everywhere. Uh, the design overlay uh, affects only about 7% of the land within the city limits. So the large blue area in the middle of the slide is, of course, the central city. Uh, all of the purple and green areas uh, spread throughout the rest of the city uh, uh, are also in the design zone, but are subject to different design guidelines than the central city. We do have two sets of design guidelines, the central city fundamentals, uh, and then the um, uh, citywide design guidelines, which are applied in design zones throughout the rest of the city, the town centers, the neighborhood centers, and the main streets. Next slide, slide please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so the tools that we use, the citywide and the central city fundamental design guidelines, uh, are organized around three major tenets of design, context, public realm, and quality and permanence. All of the guidelines fall within these three overarching headers. Okay, next slide. Uh, very recently, uh, we have updated the citywide design guidelines. Over the last four years, the Bureau, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, the Bureau of Development Services, and the Design Commission worked collaboratively to simplify and consolidate the citywide design guidelines. Uh, they now uh, represent a two-track approval process. Applicants can choose, based on the particulars of their project, to follow a cookbook approach using finite design standards, or they can choose the design guidelines path, which allows for uh, kind of more variability uh, in the designs. That's where we come in. That's where the Design co Commission comes in. By the authority you grant us, we can use discretion to go beyond simple code requirements and find exceptional design solutions. Both tracks follow the three major tenets of context, public realm, and uh, quality and permanence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, commissioners. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, citywide guidelines as applied at 92H Lands, a site that we reviewed. Our review and approval process are defined by a firm set of bylaws, depending on the ambitions of the applicant and the familiarity with the guidelines by the architect. Approval can uh, take several steps and several hearings or to finish very quickly. 
this uh, 2022 project is a great example of how an applicant and their design team crafted their proposal to meet the new guideline, citywide guidelines in direct in a direct manner and were approved unanimously in one hearing. Lens Town Center is re-emerging re from an older car-centric commercial strip to a new pedestrian-friendly mixed-use center. This project sits in the interface between the new center and the city's ex uh, existing residential neighborhoods, where it is, it is how it design, the design responds to the guidelines. So next slide, please. Uh, you know, Julie talked about the tenants, and one of them, the one of the, the first ones we look at is context. The, this project extends it's, it extends a new context, but also makes the transitions to single-family homes and lends to the north. It its main wall and entry face 92nd Avenue for pedestrians. Parking is tucked on the sides and the back. The height is held to five stories. Uh, the north and south building wings wrap around the lush south-facing courtyard with great solar access. It also frames the Lentz Farmer's Market to the south. Uh, the project has active edges on all sides. Next slide, please. The other, our other um, um, tenant is Public Realm, and as part of the transition, this project employs ground floor residential units with setback porches stair gates and privacy landscaping to create a successful transition to private uh, from private to public space limited retail brackets the corners where it is convenient for pedestrians arriving on 92nd avenue next slide please the public realm would be the third tenant that we um, we uh, we work with and uh, a tool that we work with and car parking in this case car parking utilities and bike parking are all located well away from the public areas um, uh, quality and re resilience is is the other uh, tenant that we uh, we, we uh, abide by, and the site landscaping in this case is layered and consistent, extending pedestrian streetscapes along 92nd Avenue with consistent tree canopy and understory planting throughout all areas. Next, please. Finally, the building the building design features simple, consistent use of metal and concrete panels, brick and cast in place. Concrete is a way to differentiate uh, residential porches, recesses recessed entrances, setbacks, upper floors, and daylights, daylights, hallways, and roof caps to provide an outstanding architecture for the neighborhood. Don. Yeah, this project really knocked it out of the park, and it was, uh, it was a pleasure to have it come in in one hearing and out the door, one and done. So it really demonstrates, I think, when architects really pay attention to the guidelines. Don. Okay. <clears throat> so... How has the design review served the city since its inception in 1982? And a little background, in the 1970s, during the time of urban development, uh, a, a development pattern emerged of doing a single podium on a square block with the building towards the center of that uh, block, which uh, was disaster from the pedestrian standpoint because you were walking by this fortress-like uh, vertical walls and uh, there was often no windows or anything to uh, address the public realm. So in the 1970s, and in response to this, uh, a group of architects and planners got together and advocated for design guidelines to take the city back to its uh, pedestrian-friendly roots. Next slide. Uh, whoops. Back to us. Okay. Friendly roots. Uh, from those... From those efforts, the Central City Fundamental Design Guidelines were born and have served the city well for the past 40 years by encouraging quality urban design and architecture in both public and pro uh, private development projects. A design commission was established at the same time to help designers navigate through the process and ensure that the guidelines were met. Uh, design review in the 1980s, this is an example of uh, some of the design review guidelines being applied to a major project uh, in the city. Uh, this one, in some ways, is a transitional project because it no longer sits on a pedestal, but it also pulls itself away from the public sidewalk at, at, and most of the sides of the building. However, what they did do was put really nice plazas and uh, total transparency on the ground floor, uh, which opens it up, again, for retail 
and uh, it enhances the pedestrian experience. Uh, next slide. Design review in the 1990s has evolved, and at this point, the building has been taken back out to the sidewalk line. Uh, the materials are light and reflect some of the historic building character in the surrounding areas. And it provides awnings for pedestrian weather protection, as well as, uh, again, allowing a lot of uh, activity at the ground floor. Next slide. This is the Elliott, which was uh, one of the projects that uh, was developed during the time when there were a lot, of, a lot of condominiums being developed in the city of Portland. And they used really high grade materials. Um, they did uh, rooftop green areas, a lot of balconies, and also opened up Madison Avenue, which, or Street, which had been closed off for I think the past 50 years. So there, were, there now became a kind of a nice pedestrian pathway from all of the housing to the west of, of uh, 10th and 11th Street, right into the park blocks. So that, you know, arguably it's one of the nicer pedestrian walkways in the city. Uh, next slide. This is the ninth design review in the 210s. Uh, the Ramona in the Pearl District provides a pleasant public realm and street level with ground floor courtyard courtyards, balconies, green roof, and high-quality brick facade. Uh, it happens to be an affordable building, and from the design review perspective, market rate and affordable pro building projects are treated and reviewed equally. And this one, I think, is a real success. Uh, next slide. The uh, design review process has works in conjunction with the design team development process. Uh, during the schematic phase, we often request that there be a, a DAR so that the design team gets some early feedback and knows the direction and support for what they're doing. And then during the design development, they submit for a formal review, and that usually takes about two months, and that's about the time it takes to go through the design development process. They have to do uh, uh, building uh, construction estimates as well as approval of the uh, developer and uh, the banking institutions, etc. So it's not an arbitrary schedule, but it syncs up very carefully with the design process. Great. Next slide. Now let's uh, let's see if uh, Zeri. I keep looking up, Zeri. If you uh, if you can see us and we can see you, and hopefully we can hear you. Yes, I can see you. Hopefully you can see me. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. very well. Okay, great. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Zeri Santner. I regret that I was unable to attend this meeting in person and really appreciate the opportunity for us to talk to you about what we do and how we do it. Uh, we would like now to pivot to the near future and focus on the central city. Post-COVID, most of Portland's neighborhood urban districts have come out of pan the pandemic and the work from home intact and pretty vibrant, stayed pre pretty vibrant. But the downtown core, the area between the river, the Burnside and I-405, which is its uh, most um, greatest investments and, uh, uh, and assets has been um, dispor disproportionately affected and is still struggling. Next slide, please. As you are aware, many civic and governmental organizations are actively involved in various efforts to reinvigorate the downtown core. With that in mind, the Design Commission members have been working with the leaders of both civic and public organizations in the past few months to get up to speed on the variety of works that they are involved in with the goal of identifying what Design Commission and Bureau of Development Services can do to facilitate and encourage new short and long-term efforts. Next slide, please. 
One thing we all on the Design Commission are in agreement with is the importance of activating downtown open spaces as a critical element of attracting people to downtown. It's really sobering to remember pre-pandemic activities in downtown parks and plazas compared to today, as illustrated in these pictures. However, we know that discussions are underway regarding how to begin the process of programming events that can bring the public back to city's core. And these efforts should be coordinated with Bureau of Transportation's newest program of activating certain streets as temporary open spaces. Design Commission will support these efforts in an advisory cap capacity in whatever manner that is effective. Next slide, please. The sad state of the O'Brien Square is a prime example of how a poorly maintained and inactive open space can negatively impact its surrounding land uses. The reimagining of this space currently led by Portland Parks Foundation is a welcome move. And we encourage all the involved entities in this effort to coordinate their work with the reactivation of other downtown parks and plazas to ensure success for all these collective efforts. And now I will turn over to my colleague, uh, Chandra, and thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Ari. Uh, so I wanna talk about a couple of things that uh, Design Commission has been thinking about that can improve what's happening in downtown Portland right now. One of those is thinking about storefront activation. So um, really thinking about refreshing uh, Prosper Portland storefront program where there's interest for that uh, so that um, tenants are able to put more into their into their storefronts and really make them more inviting again after um, if there's been damage done to those. We can also really think about supporting efforts by building owners and cultural institutions to infill temporary activation into those spaces that are empty. So those are efforts that wouldn't require onerous permitting or design review, but you can imagine you know, temporary art installations, you can imagine a pop-up market or performance or think about um, you know, KS Mocha, the kid curators from the MLK School in Northeast Portland, they could curate an art show in all of those places. There's a lot of really great things that Portlanders are already doing that they could temporarily sort of activate those spaces while we're kind of building back up. Um, another one is thinking about storefront uh, security upgrades. If you switch to the next slide, thanks. Um, so there's a related program, storefront security, um, design commission and BDF staff could really develop a catalog of best practices for securing storefronts downtown and uh, protect the glazing and the merchandise. And this that you see on the screen now is a really successful example of that because it does meet context, public realm and quality and permanence guidelines. And it also secures the interior of the store after hours. And what you really see here is that um, even at night, there's the ability of the light from interior of the store to be out on the street, which makes people feel more safe. It feels more active because you can see the merchandise inside and know, hey, that's a really awesome coat. I'm gonna come here tomorrow and buy it, right? Um, if you can't see anything, then it feels uh, dark and closed. And if you go to the next slide, here's an example that is less successful. So the experience of the pedestrian is really worth noting here. That first example is, is light and bright even at night when it's closed, but the second example is really no views into the store and it kind of feels like you're not supposed to be where you are, right? Which is not true. The city's for all of us. We should all be everywhere. I think it's telling to toggle back and forth between yeah. these two and just w what it's like to walk down in front of those. It's a, it's day and night difference. Yeah, so if commission and BDS staff can work together and create, here's a bunch of examples of what you can do on your property that will still look great for everyone passing by, but will secure what you needed to secure, I think that would really benefit us so that we're not left with conditions like this forever. And those could be staff level review that don't yeah. need, don't need to come before the commission. By giving them a catalog, here's, here's some good ways to do this, yeah. they can proceed. 
And then if you want to go to the next slide, uh, the last one I'll talk about is thinking about some long-term strategies. Everyone everywhere is thinking about how to transition office buildings that are empty into residential, right? We all need housing everywhere. We need it to be affordable. There are a lot of hurdles to get over in, in those kind of transitions because the floor plates are very different from what you typically need for residential. But um, those are design problems that can be solved by designers. And so um, we should really consider how those things can potentially happen. Um, uh, if in cities where they have been successful in creating this kind of transition from office to residential, they've used major public ses subsidies to actually close that gap and make these projects feasible. So it's not all going to be on the developers. There will be some funding that needs to be organized in order to make those uh, happen. So from the permitting and approval standpoint, um, those are two building type examples of downtown office space. There's a historic building and a 20th century tower. So if these were proposed for conversion, BDS and BPS, along with Design Commission and Historic Landmarks Commission, in advisory reviews, could modify code language to facilitate shorter BDS staff level reviews to keep those things moving forward and to get the city more housing, to revitalize the downtown. A lot of awesome things can come out of that. Great. So um, on our to-do list that we want to tackle soon, um, I think We've now had the new citywide design guidelines in place for about 18 months. We've had a few projects come through with them, and I think we'll hear from one of our uh, testimonies today about how that's going. But in general, what we're, what we're hearing is, is the simplification of what was a big set of design guidelines in citywide, now down to about 10 guidelines, is really just making everybody's life a little bit easier. There's not so many things to have to go through. So right now, our central city fundamental design guidelines are about 29 guidelines long. They're old. Uh, they've been, the last time they were updated, I believe, was 18 years ago. They're probably 30 years old uh, at the core. We, we think we can get those down to about a dozen design guidelines, really simplify everything. So that's on our to-do list. There is also an interesting little guide. I don't know if you guys were aware of it, but a previous commission about uh, five, six years ago, put together a little primer, like a Cliff Notes version of some of the most critical things that we typically see about the do's and don'ts of, of uh, Central City Design Guidelines, and they put that out. We think that we could do, an, and it has no illustrations in it, we think we could take the example from the Citywide Design Guidelines, which, which, which was richly illustrated with a lot of great examples around town, just showing Here's, here's a great successful way of meeting that guideline. We think we could take something like that and put out a interim bridge kind of document until we get the full formal central city guidelines revised. Again, as a, as a help to applicants coming in, maybe somebody hasn't dealt with Portland's design guidelines before, here's some things you should be aware of and it just gets, gets the process going and it's easier for everybody, easier for them, easier for us. So that's on our to-do list too, and, and uh, we, we hope to be tackling that very soon. So um, probably not surprisingly, the project Don sh or Sam showed you is uh, our project of the year for 2022. It just does so many good things in terms of reinforcing the new emerging Lens Town Center and really um, just providing a really friendly pe pedestrian realm facing the neighborhood. And so we want to congratulate um, Palindrome Communities, YBA Architects, and their design team, and you'll get to hear from Alex Yale. We reviewed about 11 major projects this last year, and we approved nine. Um, five of those were in one land use hearing, uh, which we always aim for if we can do it. Um, so what I'd like to do now is ask, um, would you like us to pause for Q&A now, or, or would you like to get through the test? We have two testimonials. We could do those and then go to Q&A. What's your preference? No one signed up. We have invited testimony. Sorry, I, I wasn't clear about that. Okay, so I'd like to invite uh, Alex Yale up to the table, and then um, 
from YBA Architects, and then Tim Eddy is going to come in by Zoom from Hanabari Eddy Architects. There you go. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alex Yale, and I'm a founding principal at YBA Architects. We're very grateful and, and humbled to receive this recognition for our work uh, by the planning department and the commission. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, lots of work in the central city. Uh, currently, we've got two projects under construction. They're seven-story uh, housing projects in, uh, in Northwest. Uh, they've been in the works for many years. One 2014 it started, <laughs> came in the door, and another 2017. Uh, projects uh, are, are uh, take a lot of a lot of time, and, and there's there's a lot of twists and turns along the way. Um, and it's just sort of an example of um, sometimes how long some of these projects take, and, and finally now we're, we're realizing uh, some of these being built. Uh, what I really appreciated about the, the DR process for 92H was, frankly, the open and honest communication that we had with our planner, uh, Hannah Bryant, along the way. We had dozens of communications early on um, about the, the new zoning code, the nuances of that, and she really helped synthesize and answer a lot of those questions in, in kind of an informal way. And, and man, that really, that really helped uh, this particular project. One of the challenges with this project, uh, like all multifamily projects that we face, is uh, the difficulty of, of getting active ground floor retail to pencil and to work. Um, so our client, like many, are always asking, how do we get uh, residential on the ground floor? And so um, I like this project being up on the screen now because I think it's a, it's a good example of how uh, we really looked at uh, historical brownstone precedents and examples and thought about the layers uh, that needed to take place between the sidewalk and, uh, and the units on the ground floor. And then uh, recognized that the corners uh, really um, were a great opportunity for active uses, uh, active retail. So we concentrated the corners uh, as, as being glazed and, um, and then we're able to use the, the rest of the meat or the body of the building for residential. And so that was, that was kind of a fundamental. And, and so that's just an example of one of the ways that um, the planning department and, and the design review process help kind of bridge the gap between uh, what, what really our clients need to get these projects to pencil and what works from good quality uh, urban design. At YBA, we believe it's our professional duty to enhance the quality of the community through better urban design. And fortunately, our clients understand that uh, when we do that, everybody prospers and they have um, a better investment and a better project that's beloved by their occupants. Um, some, uh, uh, some of the areas that I could suggest for improvement going forward that, that were new um, for us was the, uh, the neighborhood um, contact process was, was new. We were sort of a little bit of a guinea pig in that, and that was, <laughs> I will be honest, rather challenging and, and, and tricky to navigate. Um, and uh, overall, I was very happy with the design review process on this one, and um, Look forward to hopefully a streamlined uh, building uh, permitting process uh, going forward. I think that is probably an area in terms of time. Uh, I really like the graphic that was shown uh, about the timeline of design review, and it, it generally fits in very nicely with our, our overall design process and doesn't typically add uh, too much time or complexity. So um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. I had a quick question on the first floor residential, and I'll, I'll circle back to the design uh, more broadly about the potential implications for downtown. But um, you know, you often hear from developers that that first floor residential requirement that's almost a tenet of design in the city of Portland for generations, it feels like, is a real loss leader, right? It's a real challenge. So. Um, 
so you, but your solution here was you you have corner each of the corners is retail and then you have residential uh, in between is, is that did I get That's that right? correct yes yes yeah so um, it's it's a, a constant debate that we hear a lot when we have uh, units on the ground floor about having live work units and being able to walk kind of straight in and have them at <clears throat> at street level but they're typically used as apartments, mm -hmm. you know, and um, we recognize that when they are at street level and they're flush and you can walk right in, the, the windows are closed, the blinds are closed, and I don't think that helps anybody. And so we really look at other um, examples on the East Coast, uh, in Europe, and how does that really, how does it work? How does it work well? And how, how is it lasting and enduring? And so. You know, I think in this example, um, we located the units on the site also so that we had some grade change and we were able to take advantage of that. That really helps. I think having a couple of steps requires having an ADA uh, accessible hallway in the back. That's not your only, it's really your secondary means of, of getting to your unit. But anyways, um, situating a unit so it's up and raised so you're not at eye level with the street really helps and then setting it back. Um, typically there's in these higher density districts, there's a, up to about a 10 foot max allowable setback from the property line. So we took advantage of that and then created as many uh, landscaping layers and defensible space that we could. I'd generally be curious what further the city can help, can do to, in the code to, or, you know, to facilitate that, because it certainly it feels like this is a barrier sometime for projects to pencil, and yes. um, if we can. One of the, one of the great um, things that design review through design commission affords is some discretion, mm -hmm. where, where, on the other hand, if you got to follow the code right down to the dimensions and the letter and everything like that, but design commission allows us if, if an applicant is coming in with something that's actually better meeting the intent of the guideline or the code, you 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 allow us discretion to say, that's we'll we'll grant you that modification. So I think having that flexibility is, um, uh, you know, a lot of the architects recognize it. We even have architects who come through through a type two review, but they request to get feedback from design commission, even though they're going to go back to a type two review and get. Um, get actually permitted and approved through staff, they still want to hear from us. So we try to infuse that, uh, that discussion with some dialogue. I think, I think what, to, to your point, um, Commissioner Gonzalez, we oftentimes see a project come through with ground floor residential. They might have given us the setback, but not the steps. They might have given us the steps, not the setback or they left out the privacy landscaping, and all those in our mind are what it makes a difference between trying to live in a unit right at street level and mm -hmm. having your living room right outside of the sidewalk. You, you need to have some sense of separation from that to really make that successful, and you guys mm -hmm. checked all the boxes. You did all of it, and that, that was what was so impressive in meeting the guidelines, and I think that that's a model that could be applied in Central City. I'll circle back to Central City. Thank you for that, uh, but we'll circle back later on that. Thank okay. you. Could I ask a, just sort of a, maybe this is a theoretical question, but it's one we live with every day, yeah. which is the dramatic change in urban areas nationally. And this is a subject of great conversation amongst academics, amongst mayors, amongst city councils, amongst economists. And the fact of the matter is there's been a major shift from large urban centers towards the Sun Belt, towards suburban areas. And those are macroeconomic issues. They're related to changing work environments that were precipitated by um, remote work. It's precipitated by rising crime rates in urban areas all across the country, including here in the city of Portland. As you think about design, how much do these mega trends that are now demonstrable mm. nationally, um, how do you think about this in terms of, you know, P Portland isn't gonna be Portland in 1996 going forward. It is a totally different dynamic. Mm, how do you think mm -hmm. about these new changes as 
you think about your work around design. Are you designing for the same people? Are you designing for the same demographic, for the same income levels, for the same purposes? What are you thinking about these things? You want to take yeah, a I, yeah, that's a really great question, and it's something that we think about and we, we talk a lot about uh, internally and with our clients, and uh, I think you're right. I think to some extent it's cyclical. I think that um, Portland, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of appreciation for um, the environment here. I think the folks moving to the Sun Belt and other, other places, um, it's, the impact there, it's, it's just a different vibe and a different, a different feeling. Our office, we're in Old Town Chinatown, and we, to be honest with you, our staff doesn't feel safe there anymore. We're forced, we've been there, we found it, you know, we found it. And, and here's, here's my point, I, I'm not in any way you know, moving away from our problems that we are responsible here, yeah. for here. You know, violence, gun violence, homelessness, livability. I mean, we own them. There are problems. But I sort of wish it was only a Portland problem that would make it easier to solve. It's not. And mm -hmm. there's considerable survey materials out there now that suggest these are national economic trends. I mean, this is a fundamental shift in demographics. It's a shift in the way we do business and the way we work, the way we interact. And we're seeing the hollowing out of cities. We're seeing the growth of suburbs and sunbelt cities. And I, I'm, I'm not convinced that, that we can row this one alone. And, and my question is, how do we turn the tide? How do we prevent the hollowing out of our city and sort of a spiral of decline. Are, are there things we can do around design that reflect my desire to make sure that Portland remains successful going forward? Well, I, I think it's the, the, uh, the in, in attacking the problem that's gonna require from multiple fronts, from security to policing to social program, everything, but our contribution and design I think we've built, uh, we've built one of the most pedestrian friendly cities on the planet. And I personally don't want to see us abandon those values. I think those are still something that um, can serve us in the long run. But I can tell you now, I, I look at projects coming in with uh, common open space um, proposals, and I ask a lot of questions. How are you planning to make this secure? How are you planning to have this open space used in the way you think you want it to be used? How is it going to be programmed? I've been listening to some of these conversations about the future of O'Brien that Randy Gregg is doing mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. Portland Parks Foundation. I think it's very interesting yeah, uh, uh, about what other cities are encountering under the same thing, but um, I just think we have so much investment and such uh, a great fabric downtown of parks and plazas and open spaces and transit and cultural institutions that um, we got to find a way to infuse new energy around the good thing, the good assets we already have, and be able to bring those back to life. I, and I know that's not going to be easy, and it's not going to happen overnight. But we have to just start plugging away at it as hard as we can. But one of the lessons we we learned, and the council talked about this just this morning, ironically, um, is that cities that have more housing in the mix in their central city have clearly done better. Yeah post-COVID yeah. in their recovery than cities like Portland that, that have a shortage of housing in our central city. Do you think, as, as you do your design thinking, do you think more about a shift towards housing and maybe away from office space and commercial? Oh, I, I, think, I think housing probably ought to be at the top of the pyramid right now. I think in the last, in the last, well, here's, here's the guy I knew I'd really speak somebody to that. Up. In the last 30 years, we had, a, we had a tremendous growth in housing, but most of it went north of Burnside right? because we had a lot of open land up there. But if we can begin to turn our focus back south of Burnside and look for opportunities. I, I, I just wanted to add a couple of things. I'm, Please. I've developed housing in the city in multiple parts of the city, east side, west side, all of it, uh, mostly in the central city and mostly through the design review process. But I think one of the things that needs to be really understood is that the value proposition of living in the city needs to change. I mean, it was a wonderful value proposition, and it's not anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's multi, you, you mentioned it, Mayor, it's multiple sides of it. It's safety, it's uh, 
but the design piece of it is important because that is what makes a city, makes that value proposition work eventually. The question is how do we get more people into the city? I mean, there's, there's anything from taxes to, to job issues, to employment, to safety, to security, to, to the restaurants themselves. I mean, just the survivability of, of what makes it, uh, what, what makes it important for people to live in the city is being able to have access to all those things in a very, very palpable way. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, anecdotally, I'll say a bunch of friends who've looked at moving to Lake Oswego or Vancouver or whatever, and they don't find, they still don't find the value proposition is quite as, it, it's still a mix. They, they still love Portland. They still want to live here, but they still struggle with the fact that it's hard to live here sometimes mm -hmm. in the downtown area. Nonetheless, a lot of them still come back. So how do we make it so that they all want to come back? Um, I, I'm, it, it's multi-layered. It's multi. It's very complicated. I'm you sure you deal with and, all and, the complications. And I, and of I it. appreciate that. And, and again, I, I didn't expect to resolve it here. I was just curious to what. I mean, we're, we're all thinking hard about it. We're thinking right. about taxes. We're thinking about regulations. Right. We're thinking about spurring affordable housing. We're thinking about how to make the community safer and more livable. And it occurs to me that obviously design is a huge component of this. And historically, Portland has had phenomenal right. design content. And as you say, the walkability, I, I think, is critically important. The open spaces have been great uh, until they're not, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. all, all right. of a sudden, there's, there's more considerations yeah. there. And there's a palpable example of that. If you look at the different, different sub-markets within the city, you see how certain ones are doing much better than others. And it has to do with eyes on the streets, with people walking those streets, with those businesses being opened so that people actually want to patronize them. And that's what's important. How do we get that central city map, uh, that core area to, to get that? It obviously lived off the office space for most of it, because it still wasn't a 24-hour city downtown mm -hmm. with a little bit of housing. It needs a lot more. Mm. And not sure, uh, you know, uh, office, tra transforming office is complicated in our market seismic and all sorts of other reasons, costs are very high. But how do we change the value proposition? I think it starts at the ground level, which is something that we deal with constantly. The ground level is super important. I mean, what happens above is important too, but initially, if I can walk down the street and have a reasons to go to different places, that's going to activate the city and that in turn will activate the things mm -hmm. going, going up, sense. up yeah. above. Yeah. So yeah. I think we need to take radical measures, very, uh, you know, emergency measures to make sure that that ground floor is phenomenal. It really brings people up, and you see it in the Pearl District, you see it in Slab Town, you see it in some other places. So it's important, it's very important for us to make sure that that stays in place, but somehow it's incentivized to actually be activated. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, thank you. It's, it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about these days. Yeah. This is a footnote, but in my 46 years practicing here, you know, I, I was here when they removed Harbor Drive, when they put in Waterfront Park, but I've looked around and I see other cities uh, a major river and a major park, you would think we would have some of our very best development facing NATO Parkway down there, and it, it feels like it's been a leftover and a forgotten edge for all these years. I don't know why that doesn't have more, more value and more attraction, uh, because that would help a lot with what's going on. I mean, Waterfront Park, unless there's a festival, it's not a pleasant place to walk through right now in, in our city in, in 2023. So. I mean, it's just one example of an area, but it just feels like that ought to be prime real estate down there, and it yeah. feels like it's not. Agreed. Renee, did you have a question? I mean, it may just be an observation on your last point. I mean, I wonder about the historic overlay and the way that impacts the properties closest to the river. Um, we have had a strong desire, you know, to protect some of those buildings, um, but I... I'm not sure it's the product of real analysis, but I've often heard there's substantial, you know, limitations on what you can build there currently. And I, um, I don't know. It's an interesting planning question uh, how we, how we energize that space because it is, does feel like a missed opportunity, particularly on, on the west side where you don't have a highway disrupting the flow per se. So it's, um, but I, I'll be interested to hear our next folks to, uh, uh, to talk to that. I. We can maybe have the next person testify, or you can answer this now. I, I had a, was it? Did you have one more person? Yeah, we we had one more person okay. uh, joining um, us remotely. Tim, are you there? Um, 
I am. Do I have uh, audio there? You do. We can hear you. Okay, uh, great. That, sound, that sounds really good. Well, uh, Mayor, City Council members, I'm uh, Tim Eddy, and I'm president of Henneberry Eddy Architects. I just want to say that this most recent conversation you just had was exceptionally encouraging for me to hear. Um, as a downtown Portland firm, we've been involved as volunteers in these civic processes for over 20 years. And I served on the design commission from 2003 to 2010. Uh, my partner, David Wark, uh, served for nine years. Uh, my partner, Andrew Smith, who you're gonna hear from in a little bit, is currently the chair of the Landmark Commission. And one of our associate principals, Erica Thompson, currently serves on the planning commission. So we're, we're very committed uh, to the success of downtown Portland and Portland as, as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm here today uh, really in support of Portland's design review processes and design standards overall. Uh, design is a critical tool in solving the multiple crises that the city faces today. And our work and that of our clients in Portland, especially in downtown, is rooted in an optimism uh, for the future of the city. And um, so design review has been faulted along the way with increasing project timelines and project costs. And I, I want to reinforce that design review is not the problem. Process needs to move quickly, but it's an important part of the solution. And as we just heard from Alex, uh, who, by the way, that, that was a really well-crafted project at 92H, um, uh, design review has become a relatively, it's become relatively routine for most applicants. Um, the, the timelines are reasonable and you know, they track with typical project design phases. Um, contrary to this though, are the triggers and uh, extended review periods and fees levied by other bureaus uh, that often get overlaid after design review is approved. And that's uh, bureaus like transportation, forestry, and others that may follow an approved design review application and sometimes plow the same ground. Um, it can be very frustrating. And these processes add red tape, they add time, cost, and they make acquiring a building permit much more challenging and time consuming. And speeding up and simplifying these processes will be helpful uh, overall. Um, we, we, you know, we look forward, we all look forward to seeing, you know, busy storefronts and eyes on the street and a healthy public realm in downtown. Um, but getting there is going to require that the city provide more carrots and use fewer sticks uh, in the process and make, making it easier and faster to talk with planners and their colleagues before starting the processes, before you even have a pre-application conference, waiving fees for things like early assistance conversations, and generally promoting you know, more early dialogue between planners and applicants, I, I think will help. And those of us, you know, Dawn and, and Brian and everybody who's been around for uh, more than about 15 years uh, had that experience and Portland was, um, uh, planning was very accessible uh, and it's much less accessible today because everything's kind of behind a paywall and you have to apply and wait. And so those early conversations really do help. I, I do support the simplification and consolidation and updating of the central city fundamental guidelines, design guidelines, and moving forward with these revisions promptly is really important. Um, I also encourage the city to consider extending the use of design standards or discretionary design review to the rapidly developing parts of Portland that are not currently subject to design review. They're not in D zones. And particularly the unregulated centers on the east side of Portland. Um, when you travel around Portland, it's clear when you pass from a design zone to an area with no design standards. And uh, urban design, resiliency, and quality and permanence are all inherent to long-term thinking about our city. And, and they're important to building an economically healthy, desirable set of neighborhoods throughout the city. Uh, you know, many more housing and commercial projects are going to be constructed across these unregulated areas 
uh, in the next few years. And it's really important that we build projects that contribute to great neighborhoods instead of expedient but thoughtless buildings that lay the groundwork for future slums. And it, you know, in this effort, design review and prescriptive community design standards can be a, an important tool uh, for, the, for the whole city. And, and I, I just want to finish by saying that design review and design standards help everyone, everybody involved build value, whether it's for, you know, the, the developer who develops the project at 92H uh, in Lentz or uh, a project in downtown that's, a, you know, say a storefront rehab. Um, it's, it's all about building value for the, you know, the entire city. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Well, we'll we'll close here, or 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 uh, take take any other questions you want. But I, I wanted to just mention that um, a lot of our BDS staff colleagues and and some of my design commission colleagues, we've all worked downtown. Some of us have even lived downtown parts of our lives, and so I love this place. Uh, I've spent most of my career working on projects downtown, so I'm keenly interested in whatever we can do to help downtown recover. Great, thanks. I mean, this is great information. Terrific, terrific slideshow. Good conversation. Thank uh, you. Time well spent. I really appreciate your being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a report, last I checked. I want to make sure. Uh, I lost it, but it is a report, correct? Yes, this is a report. I'll accept a motion. I'll take a motion to accept the report. So moved. Second. Rubio moves, Commissioner. Was that Commissioner Ryan? Yeah, second. Seconds, any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio? I want to thank our stellar volunteer commissioners uh, for their dedication and high level of service uh, to help help make Portland such a, a better place, a more beautiful place through your design review work. Um, it's clear that because of your expertise and, and even in the conversations today, we can really see how your your uh, work really makes us better poised, you know, uh, to continuing our trajectory um, in quality urban design here. It'll take some effort, but um, our, our council is super aligned with you and we care about these things. And the, the conversation has been really great today. Makes me really eager to engage with you more and learn more um, about your ideas, uh, particularly um, intrigued around the ground floor and also equally intrigued about the mention of some radical ideas um, and what that, sound, what that looks like for you. And um, so very um, interesting uh, conversation today. Um, but overall, uh, we're, we're really ready to look at all the tools that we have to use uh, and apply all that we can do responsibly, of course, um, to catalyze more projects and increase housing and livability to the city. So just want to thank you all uh, for your deep dedication, um, your service. Um, it's very evident in this report. Also want to thank uh, Tim Heron for his work in managing and, and, and coordinating this commission's time. So thank you, Tim. Uh, this was a great presentation, and I'm happy to vote uh, yes, I to accept this report. Ryan? Yeah, thank you very much. This was actually really refreshing and very timely. I don't know if you tuned in at all to the morning session. You probably didn't have time for that, but we were talking about the conversion of office space to housing, and so this dialogue actually allowed it to go a little bit deeper. Um, a few takeaways that I have here at the moment are one, it, it, it doesn't slow things down. The, the design review is not where we need to place the blame. And I think I've heard that blame placed there. And um, in my experience, you called out where, where the delays are and rather adequate, rather clearly. And it's why I assembled um, all of the many bureaus involved in permitting. I know it's making progress and we had to get to the root causes of why it doesn't work. I think my best description of that is when we first had a task force meeting, we had people that had been doing permitting work in different bureaus that met each other for the first time. So if they're just meeting each other for the first time, I can only imagine what it's like for the customers that are, uh, that are out there trying to figure this out. So thanks for bringing that up. I also really appreciate the, the award that was given uh, to um, 90, what, what is it? Something Lentz, 92H Lentz. I've been in, too many conversations about uh, storefront uh, retail activation or none at all. And so to see one that was actually 
hit it on the mark, especially for, I, I live near the interstate corridor along the max line. And you can tell the areas that it's one or it's one thing or the other, it appears. Like it's all storefront and they're struggling to get people in or it's, I think some bad examples of what you were discussing when you said um, floor, um, people accessing their units by the floor with, without having the amenities that I saw in the 92 uh, H. Lentz building. So that was really great to catch that. So I hope this um, will become a norm as opposed to this either or proposition that we have been dealing with. And the third is because I've been hanging out with the Portland Parks Foundation on O'Brien Square. I really appreciate that that was lifted up. All of our plazas and squares, waterfront park, that will be a priority for the Parks Department. That has to be the part we play with downtown activation. I think, Sam, you, you nailed it when you said we have to have a value proposition that makes people want to live in downtown Portland. I met with somebody recently. They were not making this up. They penciled it out, and they're contemplating living in New York City um, over Portland because it actually offers a lot more amenities, in their opinion, as a pedestrian that lives in an urban core, and it's not that much more expensive because they're in a tax bracket here that taxes them quite highly, but in New York it would not. And so we have to look at even those, um, those moments and those conversations and, not, and believe them, and really believe them, because this is somebody that's in, approaching their retirement years, and we don't want them to go away. We need their currency, their intelligence, their livelihood, and their grandbabies hanging out with them, um, hanging out in downtown Portland. So um, anyway, this is very timely. It seems like we have a theme today, and it's been a wonderful theme. And also, we had a very brief lunch period, and so I ate rather quickly, and I'm like, oh, God, this is going to be rough. And it wasn't. It was rather entertaining. So thank you so much. Thank you. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Um, Riching Report, thanks so much for your time today. I'll just observe a couple of things. The residential project in length was exciting, and the way it activated that storefront or first floor is, is really interesting. Um, appreciated the observations on pop-ups and what we can do to activate in the short term. That's not necessarily long-term planning per se, but any discussion that can be had to what we can kickstart uh, empty storefronts right now, what barriers we can remove, I think is a rich conversation um, to get people living uh, downtown and smiling again downtown. Uh, I, a passing note, I have mentioned this to Chair Peterson at the county, but I just would throw out, I, I do walk around downtown sometimes and wonder with some of this empty storefront, what about preschools and what about childcare centers? Um, this is, uh, uh, we, as a region, we've committed to be more welcoming to young families. Uh, we're certainly subsidizing it heavily with our tax uh, base, and um, I just sometimes wonder about what opportunities there might be um, with some of these older buildings that have big storefront spaces and with decent setbacks, I, I wonder. So I just throw that out for uh, contemplation. I uh, also just mostly wanted to note the point on what happens after design review and the cost and the time. Um, I think when we talk about the future of downtown, I think we need to recalibrate the conversation about transportation policy as well. How do we lean in on some of the beautiful parts of our legacy, pedestrian friendly, um, public transit friendly, uh, but the same bike friendly, but at the same time, make it so that we can get projects going. And how do we how do we sync up better the design review and the, and the transportation elements that often follow? And so it's not my those aren't my bureaus, but I it's mostly just heard what you said, uh, take it seriously, and I hope we can stay focused on that as a city how to streamline those pieces on the tail end. With that I vote aye. Wheeler, thank you. Uh, I'll keep my remarks very brief. Thank you. Uh, this is great work to be continued. Obviously, we're in a new day. And I, I, I will just put my cards on the table and say some of these seismic shifts we've experienced I don't think are short term. I think they're long term trends. And I think everything we do from planning to taxing to service provision, all of these things need to take into account what I think is the new reality. And I really appreciate two aspects of what you said. Uh, number one, we still need to think about street level activation. That to me was, you, you said many, many important things during this presentation, but that's the one that's really key to me. We have to think at every level, how do you activate a city? How do you make it walkable, livable, exciting, and dynamic for the people who live here? 
or the people who visit here. And by the way, I met with a group of hoteliers this morning who don't think so much about the people who live here as much as they think about people who might be coming here for pleasure or for work. And they had a whole series of thoughts about what attracts people to come to this community. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, and not particularly surprising, it's ancillary services. They, they know Portland's an amazing place. They know from a design perspective it's unique. They know we have our green spaces, our parks, a culture of creativity and innovation, but they're worried about their public safety when they're here. And, and we need to take all of those things into account too. Uh, last but not least, since I, I won't be able to stay for the historic commission, we also can't turn our back on history yeah. and, and who, you know, where we've been. And, and the importance of preserving some of those cultural icons as we think about what are we doing, you know, as we look to the future, how do we retain what's the best of the past and make that part of our future? Um, so I vote aye, the report's accepted, thank you, it was great. I look forward to hearing a lot more from you uh, in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Um, colleagues, I have an excused absence starting 10 minutes ago. Uh, I'm going to ask that we take a two minute recess while we shift around and Commissioner Ryan will be presiding over the remainder of the session. Uh, we are in recess. Thank you. Recording stopped. Dan, do you want to move to my seat? I can get
good. Okay. All right. Welcome back for the afternoon session. Uh, Aria, please read the next item. Item 223, accept the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission 2022 State of the City Preservation Report. Okay, welcome. Thank um, you. Commissioner Rubio, you queuing us up? Yes. All right, take it away. Thank you so much, um, Council President. Um, it's a great, it's a pleasure to introduce Andrew Smith. Uh, the chair of the Historic Landmarks Commission, who, along with Vice Chair Kimberly Moreland and former Chair Kristen Miner, will present the Commission's 2022 State of Preservation Report. And I also want to welcome um, other Historic Landmarks Commission members, Ma Matthew Roman, Maya Foti, and Peggy Moretti. The Historic Landmarks Commission is a seven-member volunteer commission that advises city bureaus and city council on matters related to historic preservation and reviews new development in historic districts and alterations affecting historic landmarks. The commission typically meets twice a month for several hours at a time, and we appreciate their service and dedication to preserving the city's historic resources. As the commission's report notes, preservation is an important tool to aid our efforts for ensuring housing affordability, addressing climate change, revitalizing our downtown and neighborhood cores, and advancing our equity goals. The report also acknowledges that there are different scales of preservation, including the large-scale government-supported rehabilitation projects to the grassroots efforts by individuals and smaller organizations, all of which are critical for maintaining economic and social stability. As was recognized in the report, the formal practice of preservation has not always represented the larger community. The commission has long pushed for a comprehensive update on the city's historic resources inventory, and more recently, the creation of a cultural resource management plan in order to ensure significant parts of our history are not lost before we know what resources we have and what stories there are to tell for a more complete picture of Portland and its history. Recently, two nominations were forwarded to the National Register of Historic Places with the assistance of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability through funding allocated by Council last spring and the support of the Historic Landmarks Commission. These nominations, one for the Dr. John D. Marshall Building and one for the Jim Pepper House, are representative of this work to paint a broader picture of Portland's history, and I'm excited to hear more about these resources and for this type of work to continue. The report also highlights the Commission's Project of the Year, the Albina Library Edition, and the Street Roots Investment in Old Town. The Albina Library Project includes a bold addition to the backside of a historic library, and the design of which was informed by substantial public input. Meanwhile, Street Roots purchase and light treatment of a historic building in Old Town demonstrates their investment in the oldest part of our city and will give greater visibility to this important journalistic institution. Now, I'd like to invite members of the commission uh, to start their presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Good afternoon. Um, I am Andrew Smith, the, the new chair of the Landmarks Commission. Um, and uh, the, the National Register nominations that um, you just mentioned, Commissioner Rubio, are, are uh, the ones depicted on our title slide. So that was uh, very fortuitous. Um, just a quick reminder of what we do as the Landmarks Commission. Um, there are sort of four primary areas that we focus on. The first, um, in our quasi-judicial capacity, uh, we review type three land use cases as well as type two uh, staff level appeals. Um, we make recommendations to this council. Um, and that includes type four demolition review cases as well as changes to historic district guidelines such as the ones that we made for the South Portland Historic District uh, last year. Uh, next, we provide advice. Um, we provide advice to uh, land use applicants as part of design advice requests. Uh, we also provide advice to city bureaus such as Parks and PBOT. In addition, we make recommendations uh, to the State Advisory Committee on Historic Preservation when it comes to things such as uh, National Register nominations. Um, finally, we provide adv advocacy and outreach related to cultural and historic preservation in the city. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Peggy Moretti. I'm the newest member of the Historic Landmarks Commission, and it's really nice to be seeing you all in person again. Um, for my little part of this presentation, I would just like to say the number one thing I hope you will take away from our presentation today is that preservation and repurposing of our existing buildings is one of the key ways that the city will achieve its biggest priorities. We must recognize, respect, and use first what we already have which is such good common sense. Uh, we tend to look at problems in silos, but happily, preservation and reuse offers real progress on multiple fronts, as Commissioner Rubio already sort of mentioned. Uh, building reuse is key, indeed, to meeting equity, housing, economic, and climate goals. Regarding climate, the graphic shown here on this slide is from a study commissioned by Restore Oregon from Eco Northwest. And their findings, and by the way, there's a link to the study in your written report, show that rehabbing just one small home instead of demolishing it and replacing it with a bigger house equates to taking 93 cars off the road for a year. And rehabbing a modest commercial building instead of demolition and replacement of that equates to taking over 1,000 cars off the road for a year. And when you multiply that impact across the city for, say, five years, it has the CO2 reduction impact of taking literally hundreds of thousands of cars off the road. So we do hope that the city will incorporate this fact into the larger emissions reduction strategy that is underway uh, in, the, in the city um, or bureaus. Um, in the quest to create more housing, it is faster and often cheaper to reuse an existing building than to build new. And the Fountain Court Apartments, which you see there in the, on the slide, is an example of uh, built in or completed in 2020 by the Home Forward organization that provides 80, use, 80 units of housing. Just one example of that. And as we take overdue strides towards equity, how important to emphasize that everyone's history matters. Saving and rehabbing the places that truly embody the diversity of our heritage creates greater social sustainability and community cohesion. Next slide, please. And finally, as we urgently focus on downtown, our older buildings may well hold the key to success there. Older historic buildings are best suited for conversion to housing. An in-depth New York Times article was published just this past week that made that case quite strongly. Uh, older buildings' floor plates are better configured uh, with access to light and to ventilation and create more livable spaces more easily. And of course, that reuse creates less environmental impact. The thing to note, and this will be uh, addressed a little later in the presentation, is that right now we're missing some economic tools that will enable the fast tracking of that conversion a state rehabilitation tax credit and or other incentives to offset seismic costs would be essential and could really, really help us jumpstart that effort. Um, the slide, the picture of this building on the slide here is uh, actually my former office <laughs> building. Uh, that's the Meyer building located on Southwest 12th at Morrison, right on the streetcar line. And I think uh, nobody's talked with the owners about this, but it just struck us as a building that may very well be the type of building that would convert into an awful lot of residential units and has that right kind of configuration and also the sense of place and, and uh, community that would be fostered by that conversion. So the possibilities are really, really exciting, but we do, I think, need the city's support to make sure we have the tools to, um, to make them happen speedily. And with that, I'll turn the mic back to Commissioner Smith. Thanks, Commissioner Moretti. Um, so we'll move on to some recommended action items. Um, first off, lower economic barriers to restoration and reuse. And I think that uh, the actions that the council took this morning are a huge uh, check mark in that regard. And I was very pleased uh, to see the result of, of that ordinance. Um, we do urge you to support important state legislation, um, and Commissioner Moreland will detail that a little bit later on. Um, as Commissioner Moretti said, the state really does lack the economic tools that most other states have uh, to better enable building owners to save, upgrade, and repurpose their buildings. Uh, a particular focus should be incentives for retention and creation of housing, as well as seismic retrofits. 
Overall, we just really encourage a mindset of putting in place policies that reward reuse and discourage demolition. Uh, comprehensive plan policy 4.51 states, maintain city-owned historic resources with necessary upkeep and repair. And there are certainly a number of examples throughout Portland of the city upholding this policy. Sadly, there are many examples where the opposite is true. Uh, engine number two, Centennial Mills, and the memorial in Firefighters Park are but a few of the properties which are not being adequately maintained. Proper stewardship begins with understanding the full breadth of the assets we have which leads us to our next item, which Commissioner Moreland will discuss. Greetings, Commissioner. My name is Kimberly Moreland, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Portland Historic Landmark Commission. Um, we would like to talk about, you know, our, one of our recommended, recommended council items is the completion of a cultural resource plan. This is something that the Historic Landmark Commission has requested for several years, and there's more of an urgency today as our cultural and historic resources are being lost um, through demolition, demolition and new development and, and just um, not a, a recognition of the importance of these cultural resources. Um, we thank you, um, the City Council, for supporting um, the 2022, uh, 2022 uh, for research documentation and listing of the previous um, historic resource like the Dr. John um, D. Marshall, who in this building has passed, uh, was approved by the State Historic um, uh, Advisory of Historic Preservation to move forward to the National Park Service. So we're excited and waiting to hear if the um, National Park Service will approve this nomination. So we support, we thank you for all your support of the previous one from Dean's Beauty and Barbershop, Golden West Hotel, Billy Webb, Elk Lodge. While destinations are important, it's not enough. Um, it, we need long-term protection. And that's what a complete uh, citywide comprehensive cultural resource management plan will provide that protection for critical um, tools and assessment and identification of the remnants of uh, resources that we have left in our community. And understanding the complex and diverse nature of our built environment will require ongoing research and including resource survey maps. And this is a large part due to the city's diverse history, which is unrepresented on our historic, um, uh, uh, on the history of our, our city, which has never been surveyed. And there's a movement within the national uh, a historic preservation movement to, to go beyond architectural significance to cultural significance where we're looking at the lives of the people and, um, and the, the culture versus uh, uh, architectural gem. And, and so oftentimes these cultural resources aren't um, as stately as our previous um, architectural um, uh, buildings. And so it's important that we um, survey um, these resources with a different lens than we have done in the past. And so, um, and we also, you know, really are grateful for the historic resource code that was recently adopted by the city because it does provide greater lo local control over historic destinations and what we want to hold up and acknowledge as important touchstones in our community. And we have an ongoing obligation to make um, progress in identifying, designating, and protecting important historic resources before they are lost. And the City of Portland funding and dedicated staff support in 2023 are critical, critically important to ensuring that these buildings, places, and stories of all Portland communities are recognized and preserved for future generations. Next slide, please. We are really hopeful that additional preservation tools that uh, Commissioner Smith and uh, Commissioner Moretti has alluded to are being considered for state and federal um, regulations. And we, we urge you to, um, to, uh, to be mindful of these. Um, we are, there are several uh, programs on the screen. The first two, the HR 2294 and the uh, 
uh, SB 149, I had the pleasure of working with uh, um, the state group um, led by Representative Valarama and Representative Levy to identify ways to make these tools more equitable. And, um, and also SB 154 is the outcome of that state work group. And um, I'd like to thank Brandon Spencer Hotto for his leadership on that group as well. And so uh, that group has um, extended the, the um, exploration of this bill so that there can be a study to look at the maximum assessed value because that has become a burden for some property owners. And we also um, are looking at um, reimagining historic tax credit growth and up, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, reimagining uh, the historic tax credit and the preservation grant program so that um, members of our community who, are, um, who have not been able to take advantage of these benefits will be able to, especially owners of, of historic homes that maybe have a fixed income or um, are not, um, cannot uh, make that initial investment. So they're looking at a grant program. And so um, there's also a federal program um, that's been looked at, look at too, it's the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act of 2021, which is HR 2294, which will improve and enhance the historic tax credit, including permanently increasing the credit to 30% for the pro project under 2.5 million and make it easier to use for smaller projects. So that's another equity initiative to help um, others access this program as well. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. um, uh, since the start of, of the pandemic, many legacy businesses in Portland have struggled <coughs> or gone out of business, like Geneva's Barbershop and several others. And since 2020, the Portland Historic Landmark Commission has advocated for the city council staff to study and financially support um, the implementation of a legacy business program designed to support the city vulnerable legacy businesses. And I had the opportunity to work with a graduate student whose work at the foundation of this legacy program. And I would like to thank Brandon Spencer Hotto again for his leadership in acquiring a, a congressional direct spending of, um, of 352000 to initiate a legacy business program in Portland. And this, pro this program will provide relevant resources to all legacy businesses that meet specific um, criteria to remain economically um, viable and, and potentially protect older buildings. Um, and we'll talk more about seismic upgrade and, and hopefully um, that will be included in this bill as well as many of legacy businesses are occupied by older buildings. And the Portland Historic, uh, Historic Landmark, again, commend Brandon Special Hotter for his leadership. And we would look forward to um, what this program has to offer um, to members of the this legacy business community. And next, um, I would just like to talk about um, the monument program as it's part, part of the watch list. And, and what I'm really excited about, was before we published this report, um, we, the Historic Landmark Commission had um, identified this as a priority and to make sure that any decisions about the replacement of our monument would include broad community um, feedback and support. And, um, and as you know, there's some difficult histories that um, have been associated with some of the monuments. And so we're really happy that RAC has decided and announced that they're moving forward with the steering committee to look at um, and, uh, and really get broad community feedback on the replacement of these monuments. And hopefully not only will we talk about the replacement, but we also think about new ways of honoring um, histories of, of important um, members of our community in all, in all communities. And so we um, urge you to uh, continue to set this as a, as a priority as we, um, as the, and we also would love to be a part of those conversations.
and I'd turn it over. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Continuing with our watch list, um, this is a newcomer to it, the Vista Bridge. Um, as, as I'm sure you all know, a decade ago, fences were erected on the Vista Bridge due to a number of suicides that had taken place in previous years. Thankfully, the fences have done their job and they've prevented, successfully prevented additional tragedies. However, there are downsides to the temporary fences having re remained in place for 10 years now. First off, they negatively impact the visual integrity of the National Register listed bridge. But for, perhaps more importantly is the physical harm that the fences are causing. Leaves and debris have collected between the fences and the historic balustrade, trapping moisture and allowing it to seep down into the steel reinforcement in the bridge deck. Uh, vegetation has also begun to grow along the balustrade, as you can see in the lower right image on the screen. Um, and the roots of that vegetation grow into and weaken the bridge's joints. If the cycle of deterioration is not interrupted soon, it could have significant effects on the structure. We understand that PBOT has previously sought funding from ODOT to address the Vista Bridge. And we would be happy to assist with uh, joining the advocating uh, on, on the bridge's behalf. And uh, we also recommend that a condition assessment be performed along with a design concept study to look at what a permanent solution might be for the Vista Bridge. Uh, the final two items on our watch list are um, obviously quite familiar topics, URMs and our own downtown. <laughs> Uh, as you are likely well aware, there are about 1,650 URMs within the city. 200, about 250 of those buildings alone contain over 7,000 residential units. Commissioner Fodi and I participated in a URM work group, which was convened in 2019 to study and recommend a path forward for these structures. The work group was disbanded by the Bureau of Emergency Management and Bureau of Development development services during the upheaval of 2020 and was not reconvened. Meanwhile, our peers in Seattle are pressing forward with an ordinance requiring owners to retrofit their buildings, but they're doing so alongside a resource program that will support those owners. A renewed commitment from the city of Portland is needed to address the significant public safety risk. And then downtown, um, obviously it's an economic driver of our region and the place where visitors really focus their exploration when they, when they come to our city. Every effort should be made to revitalize downtown from a cleanliness, safety, and economic standpoint. We recognize the expediting groups that this council has authorized to study and implement creative solutions and we view those as a very positive step forward. And we'll move on to success story. My name is Kristen Miner, and I am in my last year of um, serving on the Landmarks Commission, and I'm just going to add my voice for a few slides here. It'll be my last time at the dais, but <laughs> there's a new leadership team, which is great. Some of the preservation successes that we're highlighting in our report are happening at older buildings and not necessarily those that have the formal historic designation. And these places can be businesses, as Commissioner Moreland talked about in the legacy business program that's going to start being implemented in Portland. But um, I also wanted to talk about a couple of programs that are happening um, that are focusing on residential. One of those is called Taking Ownership PDX, and the owner of that will be talking to you a little bit later in this presentation, so I'm not going to focus too much on that, but you'll be hearing from Randall Wyatt as one of our invited testifiers. Um, the other that we're focusing on today is at the Rebuilding Center. The Rebuilding Center in North Portland sees firsthand the demolitions and um, the building materials that come in as a result of gentrification. And they've been developing programs specifically for BIPOC homeowners and 
and maybe renters. In, these are early days, but um, these are very exciting programs that are really coming up as grassroots to, to, um, to create successes. Um, next slide. And then finally, we have several slides to show our projects of the year. Um, this is the first time we've awarded uh, an award to a staff level review. The Street Roots new building has actually been around since 1926. Uh, I think that lower photo is perhaps a 1970s vintage. But it's a hugely visible site at Northwest 3rd and Burnside. And again, you'll be hearing more um, about that project. Uh, we have the owner of Street Roots, uh, Kaya Sand, as another of our invited testifiers. But I did wanna say that there's so much great thorough work happening in BDS and it seems appropriate um, as code changes allow for more reviews to happen at the staff level review rather than coming to us that we occasionally recognize these projects. Next slide. It's um, my just pleasure to announce that we, one of our projects of the year at the Albina Library, this thoughtful planning process had uh, created a, a significant building that um, the community is a, to be so proud of. And on December 12th, uh, 2022, the Historic Landmark Commission approved this um, alteration to the historic um, Albina Library located at 216 North Knox Street. And the proposed work includes a seismic ref uh, retrofit, rehabilitation of the interior of the historic library, as well as demolition of one of the later additions and a construction, a new construction of uh, a new 32,000 square feet addition to the to accommodate the library space, and you'll learn hear more about this wonderful project. But I just wanted to say that the project team conducted over five community outreach events, which I was a part of one, uh, some of those, with a specific focus on engaging in non-dominant stakeholder groups and the community outreach has determined many aspects of the dis design. And it was led by Sandra Robertson of Level Architect and her thoughtful uh, and uh, mindful uh, leadership really created a, a building that, um, that really will define that area and add a wonderful addition to the existing building. And I think I want Commissioner Moretti says it best when she says, I want you to put on record how excited I am and how I'm grateful for the wonderful quality of thought and want to say love that went into the design of this and that the thoughtfulness and the engagement, I can only imagine the amount of effort. And, and to me, to, to Peggy, she said this was the kind of thoughtful outreach that is needed in all projects. And this community deserves something excellent. And as you know, uh, the Albina community has experienced quite a bit of negative history, and this uh, project will really elevate some positive energy. So, thank you. So, commissioners, that concludes our presentation. We do have three invited uh, testifiers. Uh, if, if you'd like to roll straight into that. Yeah. <clears throat> you all could with that. Go to the invited testimony. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Randall, I see that you are on the Zoom, so uh, please, please proceed. All right. Um, I was told I can control my own slides. Um, I think I need to be made a host to share my screen. I will stop sharing. Thank you. All right. I'm Randall Wyatt. Thank you very much for allowing me to share my work and speak to you all. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of Taking Ownership PDX. Taking Ownership PDX is a community and reparations-based organization founded with the intention to activate and utilize community members and their resources for equitable change. 
Together, we renovate and revive Black-owned homes and small businesses that have requested our help with an emphasis on enabling Black homeowners to age in place, generate wealth, and simultaneously deter predatory investors and real estate professionals to deflect the gentrification process. Why this work is important. important. Portland has a, hist a history of racist and predatory real estate. And uh, I'm sorry, can't see that. Oops. <laughs> um, real estate practices that have targeted and excluded and displaced the, the Black community and small business owners and homeowners since Black people have been permitted to live in the state of Oregon. Due to a lack of efficient and impactful equitable change from our policymakers and enforcers, we decided to take grassroots actions to provide equity and justice to the Black community of Portland through reparations in the form of home and small business repairs, renovations, financial assistance, and advocacy. We also needed to provide a clear path of reconciliation and justice for our allies who want to provide resources and physical labor to create quick, tangible results that help combat the consequences of economic exclusion and various forms of oppression the Black community has suffered for hundreds of years. Also, in um, the Ombudsman report recently showed that the city's BDS de uh, department, the reliance on complaints for property maintenance enforcement disproportionately affects diverse and gentrifying neighborhoods with liens and fines disproportionately impacting black and brown homeowners in areas where affluent people are moving in. How we do this work, we fundraise through donations and grants. We use volunteers to do basic cleanup jobs um, and landscaping and also prep work for our contractors and vendors. Uh, we have partnerships with many other organizations and, and companies in the city uh, and we, we collaborate to provide resources. Uh, we hire contractors and vendors to do the work. We have a refer referral form on our, on our website to where the homeowners can go and business owners can go to sign up and be put on our wait list. And we currently have a, over 200 people on our wait list. So there's a severe need for these services in the city. And we provide advocacy. We raise awareness on what's going on in the black community and what, what kind of resources are needed. Um, what we've accomplished since our inception of in June of 2020, we have raised over $1.6 million, mostly through private donations from our community members and allies. Signed up over 400 volunteers who have done an estimate of $160,000 worth of labor for homeowners and small business owners, helped over 150 Black homeowners and small business owners with various repairs, renovations, cleanups, and financial assistance, and uh, I participated in the Portland Charter Reform Community, which helped create some measures on the 2022 midterm ballot. And I've met with several city officials and government branches about creating more equitable and inclusive practices. This is our goal for this year. Um, we need funding in a major way. So uh, things have slowed down. I, I guess something's going on in the economy um, where we, you know, with us surviving off private donations, um, we've seen quite the, the cut in donations. So um, any kind of help with funding sources would be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, the future of taking ownership PDX is we're getting our nonprofit status so far. Uh, currently we operate as an LLC with a fiscal sponsor, which is all ages music PDX, but we're in the process and should help hopefully have our status by the summer. Uh, we collaborate with pre-apprenticeship programs like Portland Youth Builders, um, we basically, we provide hours for the students to um, get certified in the trade that they're pursuing, and they provide free labor um, for, for our projects. It's a great symbiotic relationship, and I'm looking to start more collaborations with more pre-apprenticeship programs. Uh, we have a partnership with Portland State University Capstone students in the Racial Equity in Oregon Capstone class. They do grant writing for us and other uh, projects for us in exchange for hours towards their capstone um, credits. Um, we also, the big picture is to expand this uh, model of group economics and reparations um, and community uh, to all marginalized communities nationwide. Um, how people can get involved is you can make a financial donation through our website, takingownershippdx.org. Uh, you can submit a business or organization to our public resource list. This list is an area where you can go and see um, different businesses that align with our values and they're categorized by 
uh, if they're LGBTQ, BIPOC, allies, or, or woman-owned, um, you can sign up as a volunteer, refer a homeowner or a small business owner with their permission, contact us, or learn more about our organization. Uh, that, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much for letting me share that with you. Thank you, Randall. Next. Yep. Um, uh, next, we have Kaya Sand with Street Roots. Oh, she's here in person. Welcome, Kaya. You know how it works. Yeah. On the street. <laughs> Slides pulling up here. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. I am so grateful to the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission for honoring the Street Roots Burnside Building as one of the projects of the year. We actually break down break ground tomorrow at 11 a.m., so this is incredibly timely. In fact, right now, our vendors are rehearsing in the streets of Old Town. They're, they're practicing a swing dance that they're going to do through the neighborhood because we really are celebrating our whole neighborhood as we start this project. So in... Oh, hi. <laughs> I, I haven't seen you in a while. Um, in, in 2018, Dave Audie, principal at Holst Architecture, pledged to me that when the time came, Holst would design a new space for Street Roots Pro Bono. That was an incredible pledge and a significant seed of confidence. So when our service ex is expanded um, beyond what we could really handle in our very tiny space, I called him, and this was during the pandemic, and he was ready. So first we had to find a building, and we were committed to the Old Town neighborhood because it is such an important nexus of transportation so that our vendors can deploy all the way around the region um, to sell the paper, but also because of the neighborhood. It is a neighborhood of historic displacements, and that knowledge grounds our work. It was a bustling neighborhood of Japanese American families who in 1942 were forced off the sidewalks and from the motels and the homes that they lived in with only what they could carry, incarcerated first in the Portland Expo Center on government orders. So it's important that we bring that knowledge forward in this neighborhood in which we work, this history of displacement, of incarceration, and also of poverty. I actually can see the motel where my grandmother, as a teenager, tried to survive in what she called Skid Row with her brother. Um, and so that I can see from the windows of our building. A Street Roots vendor, Jason Shear, found this building for us. I was biking around, a map in my hand, when I ran into him. And he told me that there is a building on West Burnside and Third Avenue that should be ours. And he thought it was perfect because it's prominent. And our vendors wanted to be seen in this city when they're so often told to not be seen. And it also is on Burnside. And that, again, is a historic importance to us. Street Roots started about 30 years ago as Burnside Cadillac, which is a nickname for a shopping cart. So many people experiencing homelessness grew up here in Portland and feel connected to the city's history, to its buildings. Remembering, for instance, when this building was United Clothing and before that, of course. The Holst Architects began this project with conversations with vendors. Nikki Stauffer and Hannah Resnick are here today and they have put in so much work want to just wave. <laughs> I tried to do a selfie with them earlier. Um, and they are pursuing the design historically as we approach this. We're striving as an organization for people's foundational needs and also we're attending to their dreams. If we could just advance um, slides. So this is actually showing a concept for the design that you might recognize as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The physiological, the base needs are the base basement of the building, the showers, the laundry, going up to safety and love and beyond belonging and esteem where our vendors gather when they earn income, all the way up to our rooftop. This is a narrow building in Old Town. It's a historic building. So it was difficult to 
to come up with everything we needed, but we, we used this design um, pyramid and the, the, the rooftop actually recognizes dreams. So that is where Hannah and Nikki worked hard to design a space that works for our city in terms of universal design. It's bringing in actually more green space to Burnside and our old town. The whole uh, wall around this classroom that we're building is um, green space. So it's gonna be beautiful, it'll be a space where where people experiencing homelessness can do job training, um, classes, and actually have a safe space that's natural because they do not often, it's very difficult to feel safe when they are always uprooted and swept in the streets. So it's very important that people have a place that actually where they don't, they know they're not going, going to have to move. Um, so I just want to also point out that this whole project is partner after partner, Shields Oblitz Johnson, O'Neill Construction. Um, but I want to say that we're really pursuing this building as a building for the whole city. That this is, we want this to be a prominent space that everyone can be proud of, that's beautiful because poor people deserve beautiful things and that connects the past to the future. One that brings people experiencing homelessness into the heart of the city, into all of our hearts, into the heart of humane policy and the heart of what it means to revitalize this city by making sure that the people suffering have what they need. Thank you very much. <laughs> I had my flashlight on because I think I was blinding them. Was I blinding you? <laughs> yeah. All right, we have one more. Chandra Robinson with Lever Architecture. Might need to advance the slide there. Uh, hello again, I'm Chandra, uh, principal of Lever Architecture, and we're really honored to um, be on the list of best projects this year uh, as nominated by the Historic Landmarks Commission. We actually were tasked with uh, designing new additions for both the Albina and the North Portland libraries, both libraries in the black community. And so as Kimberly mentioned, we did do an extensive amount of engagement and I myself was at all of them. So probably 65 different times we went out into the community in different ways and talked with folks. And that was during the pandemic. So we did a lot of things on Zoom, but we also did things in person. And, uh, um, it was really great just to be out in the community and to connect with people and see what it was that they needed in their lives that the library could potentially offer. So uh, both of these libraries, uh, what's remarkable about them is these are both small Carnegie libraries and over 100 years old, really beautiful, but um, not seismic, seismically reinforced to perform in an event here. And so part of what we were doing is um, upgrading both of these libraries, both of the Carnegie buildings, so that they will be safe in an earthquake event. Um, the other part of what we were doing was adding what additional space we could. So all of this funding came from the bond that voters voted for in 2020 to upgrade all of the libraries essentially and do a, a flagship library. So um, what you see on the screen right now is the new addition for the Albina Library and it's the one that had a larger amount of space, amount of site. So that's the 32,000 square foot um, addition that you see there. And it's a two-story library. There is administration space on the ground floor and then a really large reading room on the upper floor and in the existing Carnegie Library is where the children's space is. So it's going to be a really great play with beautiful historic details and very charming and fun colors um, and kid sized furniture and things like that. So it's going to be really cool. Um, what was really great about working with Historic Landmarks Commission on this was that when we came in we had a building that looked similar to this but not exactly the same and we had metal panel uh, that was this color and we had windows that had sort of a more, I don't know, I'm gonna just call it playful, a playful sort of uh, placement. And what we heard from Landmarks was that um, even though this neighborhood, you know, you can't actually see the addition from the existing Carnegie, you can only see a little bit because there's a big grade change on the site. So even though you can't see those buildings together, we still wanted it to resonate with that period of time, at least a little bit. And then across the street from the addition is the Wonder Ballroom and another historic building. Uh, so that's stucco and characteristics of that are very short ground floor and a very tall, voluminous um, upper floors, right? So uh, what we heard from Landmarks was that it wasn't 
quite there. It wasn't fitting in with the historic nature of what was right across from it, even though there's not a lot in that neighborhood that actually is historic. Um, so what we did was we, instead of metal panel, we have a really interesting brick detail. So the bricks are all kind of canted, and that still gives this kind of striated pattern on the exterior. And then we um, placed the windows differently so that they were a little bit more regular, which was more like what was happening in the historic buildings. And so I think the whole point of this is that, you know, we're not trying to match a historic building, right? We're just trying to make sure that what we're designing um, isn't in competition with it, isn't sort of opposite to it, but it allows that building to be appreciated for what it is, while we can make much more modern additions onto it by still just using some older materials, right? Not, it's not all glass. Um, and because we had all of this community engagement that really decided what it was that we needed to do with the library, Historic Landmarks Commission was very um, excited about that, and they really understood that we're designing in a different way because we're designing for a community today and not a building from you know 1911, right? And not a community from 1911. Um, and uh, it may be surprising to know, but because these buildings are up on plinths, you have to walk up to them. They now have ramps, of course. But for some folks in the community, those actually seem intimidating. It's more like um, a courthouse type of building where people feel like they don't want to go into that space, right? So creating something on the other side that's very low still and human scale and is actually at the ground plane instead of elevated on a pedestal is a way to make people feel more comfortable, right? So there are a lot of things that we did inside the building that are specifically for the kinds of folks who are coming in, what they've asked for. But really, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Historic Landmarks Commission for working with us on this and for understanding that you know we can't we can't just build something that looks like a historic building. So lots of folks don't really know what it means to work with historic landmarks in, in review, um, but uh, it's very pleasurable. You have great conversations about design and what our communities are like today. And so for the North Portland Library, even though we weren't going through historic landmarks, it was a type two, we still did a voluntary DAR with them to discuss the design. And then for the Albina Library, it's a type three, it's in a, um, uh, uh, more, a bigger designation zone, right? That, so um, we did a type three, so that means we did have to do the actual hearing with landmarks, but we also did a DAR before that. So, um, you know, yes, I'm on design commission, and so I obviously think that it's valuable, but even being um, an applicant, um, it's always a, a valuable experience and conversations that we have about design um, that really make projects better every time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yolanda. And this is the Albina, but do you have the North Portland photos as well? I don't think we have a, okay. a view of that, but I can send it to you. Okay. And that's on Killing. It's super cool. Right. Yes. Yeah. I'm so glad you have the aerial photo in here. Yes, it yes. It really helped put this all together. Yeah, and it, those that's the operations building, so there's a lot that was being taken out of there, but seeing the aerial, you can tell that right. it's not this giant building that's going to overtake the little Carnegie, right? Right. Really see the flow you were talking about. Yeah. Did you have a question? I did. A su super exciting project. I was on the Library Foundation board when the bond manager oh, passed. Oh, yes, so yes, it's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful to see these projects yeah, coming online. Yeah, we're very excited. Uh, I, you know, you, I actually learned a lot from that project about historic landmarks and sort of, yeah. you know, the type of architecture that's deemed, would you call it compatible? with yes, it? Yes, exactly. Would that be that? Okay, yep. so, you know, there's so much discussion inside the city right now for residential neighborhoods mm -hmm. where you may have historic overlay. And mm -hmm. is there anything from that project that helps shape the discussion in residential neighborhoods? Because when I look at this, the goal is compatibility, yeah. not replication. Right. And it's, it's a, um, again, I'm just, it's eye opening for me. And I'm just curious your perspective on how that might apply in residential neighborhoods that might have historic. Yes, because Design Commission often does see projects that seem small and they're infill projects into a place where maybe it is a bunch of Victorians or something, right? And so when we think about compatibility, we think about the scale, we think about the materials, we think about placement of the windows, if there's a porch or no porch. So you can imagine, you know, in an area where there are a lot of the, um, big old Portland homes, if you put something in there that turns its back to the street, that is, you can't really see where the living room is, so you don't think that, you don't know that there are people in there, right? Or the garage is forward instead of the garage being underneath or behind, right? Um, I think part of the life of the street is having people on porches, having people be able to look out onto the sidewalk and see that their kids are playing in the yard and just see who's going by, right? That's what makes it feel like uh, people live there, you're welcome to be there. And so I think when we think about new 
uh, new buildings that are going into those places. It's really about that. It's about how it doesn't have to be the same materials, but you know, if you can get windows that sort of feel like they're in the same places, even if they're much bigger or they're sort of skinny, like um, those are, we're really thinking about all the same things. Well, that's fa I think there's opportunity for educating Portlanders on this because the yeah. historic designation creates so much tension sometimes, yes. but to see something like that where you're really, you're adding real square footage, you're opening up the community, yes. and you're not trying to replicate what existed is, right. is eye-opening. Um, I guess just, uh, I'm geeking out on libraries for a second. Yeah, so when you right. talk about the change of libraries and use different than maybe when it was originally designed, yeah. you know, certainly the Inner East Side libraries we're talking about, a lot of reading rooms. I mean, the old yeah. Hawthorne Library, it's like, it's always overfilled with young families. Wh right. What are some examples for that library in particular uh, that were different from the original use, maybe, a, you know, roughly 100 years ago? So libraries have gone through a big change instead of just being a place for books and a place for education where there was a sense of like, we are educating you, we're welcoming you to our space, but this is a place for academics. That's changed very much. Now libraries are for people. So yes, you can get your books online, but you go to the library because it's a place where you can be with the rest of your community. So for instance, in the Albina Library, we have a really large community space because community members asked us for, they said, hey, you know, if I'm an immigrant from another country and it's COVID and I cannot go see my family, I would like to be able to see this wedding on Zoom in a big room with other members of my family who are here, right? So it's about connecting people to other places as much as anything. Um, there are also uh, specifically designed teen rooms that we actually worked with a group of teenagers in uh, North Portland and we did this through sort of every phase of the design, but they designed that teen space, you know? What kind of furniture, what amount of privacy do they feel they need? They don't want to be in sort of a fishbowl where everyone's staring at them, even though people want to monitor them. They don't need that kind of uh, surveillance, right? There are spaces in there that now have uh, water so that they can be maker spaces and a lot of different kinds of activities can happen in there. And then there are both outdoor spaces that are completely surrounded by the building so they feel really safe because people said that they wanted to be able to read outside, um, but they didn't feel safe just sitting on the sidewalk on a bench. They wanted a place where they could take off their shoes and ground themselves to the earth. We really worked with a bunch of different affinity groups. So the disabled community, indigenous folks, Latinx folks, and the black Portlanders community. And and um, also immigrants and refugees. And so we had very specific focus groups for those, uh, all of those folks. So we have you know, a sensory room in that space. So for neurodivergent kids, it's a place to go and kind of calm down um, if they're overstimulated, but it's also the space that's gonna be used for prayer. So if you are a person who prays multiple times a day, um, if you're a Muslim, then you can go in there. You can spend more time at the library because you have a place where you can pray and then you can go back and do what you were doing in the library. So there are so many, I could talk to you forever. I know you're geeking out on libraries. Totally I do too. <laughs> but there are so many different things that we put into libraries now that we did not do when the Carnegies were built. Yeah. In a, in a context of historic overlay, it's fascinating. Yeah. Thanks so much. You bet. Speaking Dalton. of history, you say when the Carnegies were built. Will yes. you just elaborate a little bit on that? So, um, you know, the Carnegies were all built through specific funding from the Carnegie family, Carnegie. right? Yeah. Um, and they were, that was philanthropy. They were making it so that we had access to books and, and, um, and educational tools. But the libraries were also sort of created in this time where it was like, there are classes of people and some of us have this access to knowledge and education and we're gonna essentially do you a favor by, by letting you also have access to it in your little Western boom town, whatever, you know? Um, and so really now what we think about in terms of libraries is they are, the world is a hard place to be, right? Um, especially in these last four years. Um, and so, I'm not gonna say libraries are community centers, but they're very focused on people because people need, um, need more. People, we've recognized, I think, that people need more. People always needed more, right? But because libraries are public, they have to provide this public service and they have to base it on what people actually need. So it's not a food bank, it's not a clothes bank, but it is a place where you can go and learn how to do your taxes or take a class on computers or take a class that helps you understand how, um, how mortgages work and how you can buy a house, right? And so help your family set, set up 
themselves for success, right? So, and, and libraries invite everyone. Um, all different languages are spoken there. Our Multnomah County libraries have five languages that they translate everything into. And those languages change over the years. You know, when I lived out in, in Rockwood, it was um, a lot of Russian immigrants mm. and um, Hispanic folks like myself, I'm half Mexican. And, and today there are so many different African languages spoken there that the libraries change what they offer based on the community. And the communities change over the years, so the libraries have to change as well. Thank you so much. You bet. Uh, any more invited testimony? No. Okay. And before we do our deliberations, um, is there anyone signed up for testimony? Yeah, we have three people signed up. Oh, great. Let's, let's hear that before we vote and before we talk. Right. Yeah, first up we have Wendy Ram. Oh, Wendy, you're muted. Hello, Wendy. Hi there. You can see me then. We can see you. We can hear you. Your, okay. The time is going to start ticking right now. Okay. All right. Um, I'm Wendy Rom, and uh, thanks to City Council uh, and especially to the Landmark Commission for this report. Uh, and this discussion was great, and so was the Design Commission discussion. Um, I'd like to call out one item. Um, uh, the loss of monuments noted in section 8.1, page 22. We need a public engagement process that is transparent and unbiased. I am not convinced that is what we are heading towards. I suggest you look at New York City's model, whose process resulted in both inclusive and forward-looking conclusions. Recommended was, the, uh, was an acknowledgement of gaps in our history, which this report supports by urging saving not just what is beautiful, but what is meaningful. Uh, that will fill in historic gaps. The report also urges us to, quote, acknowledge and protect cultural, historic, and meaningful places. Uh, it urges you to, quote, keep the city's commitments to preservation and, quote, to discourage demolition. Incentivize adaptive reuse, including converting downtown commercial properties to residential. Yes, to all that. To fill in those historical gaps, the New York model urged an additive approach, not erasure or a subtractive one. What does that mean? Take, for example, Lincoln's statue felled by vandals. Abe, like other statues removed this way, is designated historically significant per the new code. Yet Abe has not been put back on his South Park block pedestal. Leaving him in storage is a form of demolition, but without following the demolition code requirements. To follow its own code, the city has an obligation to put A back now. Not doing so is subtractive. To be additive is easy. Put him back with the new dent in his forehead, now part of his story. His plinth sits on a four-cornered slab. Each corner or side could have a new historic marker that tells a fuller story, fills in missing, missing historic gaps. For one corner, prioritize the Native American story of loss of life. The forehead dent could be another story. The Emancipation Proclamation, another. This more nuanced approach tells a more complete story, recognizing all stories matter. A president who saved the union certainly matters with all his flaws and missteps that human beings inevitably make. Restoring downtown statues meets another goal in this report, that of quote, breathing new life into the tourism industry downtown. Abe was always a favorite of tourists and of students who regularly put flowers in his hand. Restore these monuments now and then have a process. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Next. Next up, we have Aubrey Russell. <clears throat> Aubrey Russell. Aubrey Russell, you there? Okay. Why don't we go on to the next one and then come back to Aubrey? Yeah, next up we have Rod Merrick. And I think Rod is joining us online. You said Ron or Rod? There he is, Rod. Rod, we're excited. We can see your square. 
If you can unmute, show your face would be great if you can, and your time will begin. You just muted. Rod, can you unmute? It's still there. We can coming. hear you, Rod. I'm getting there. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. All, all right. I'll see you. Right. There you go. Good to see you guys. Um, I'm Rod Merrick and um, co-chairing the Portland Coalition for Historic Resources, but speaking on my own behalf. I just wanted to um, briefly express my appreciation uh, for the opportunity to support the preservation of historic resources in our city. The Portland Land Historic Landmarks Commission is doing important work and the work of its dedicated and capable commissioners and supporting staff are to be commended and are much appreciated. Preservation of historically significant buildings, landscapes, and artwork, including memorial statues, are integral for sustaining tourism, promoting economic development, and for the education of present and future generations of Portland citizens. More than anything, Portland needs to dedicate funding. And I'm speaking here about the budget process um, for Portland government, uh, needs to dedicate funding to update its inventory of historic resources, a process which has been all but dormant for a generation. And now speaking to the report itself, the report before you highlights the cost to the environment, the culture, and the massive contribution to the solid waste stream of demolition of viable structures. It points to the measurable environmental costs of new constructions as well. All of this speaks to the need for policies that support preservation as the first consideration when new spaces and places are needed and under development. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Rod. Aria, who's next? Um, that That's completes it? testimony. Okay. Aubrey, not here yet? All right. We'll move on. Council members, any questions before we go to the vote? Okay. Would you like to make a motion? Pardon me? Would you like to make a motion? Oh, there, that's right. We have to make a motion for reports. Do I hear a motion? So moved. <laughs> Commissioner Rubio, and it's been seconded by Commissioner Gonzalez. Rubio? Um, so first, um, I want to thank Andrew and uh, Kimberly and Peggy and Kristen for your presentation uh, on this report. Uh, it was really, really uh, informative. Um, this is really, really important work and it's a very timely presentation. And um, it ensures that we can retain and preserve the important parts of Portland's history that's a fuller and truer recognition of that history because Portland belongs to all of us. Um, and as exemplified in Street Roots and uh, building and the Albina Library, um, these are great, great projects to li lift up as an example of that. So thank you both for being here and, and sharing about those projects. It was very inspiring to me. Um, I also appreciate uh, the thoughtful recommendations and I wanna state my eagerness and my commitment uh, to engage more with you on these, um, especially on the cultural resources management plan um, and also the legacy business program. Those are very important things um, and the they need that support to get off the ground and to, to, to keep moving um, so that no other pieces of our history are lost. Um, I too want to shout out to Brandon Spencer Hartle because I think he's amazing as well and he's he's such a strong backbone for this work. So Brandon, you're you're wonderful. Um, we're very lucky to have you here in the city. Um, and then regarding the legislative work, um, I'm also happy to note that our government relations team is advocating in Salem um, as we speak for all the tax in incentives that you've outlined to support historic building preservation. So that's good news. And finally, I'll wrap up. Um, Kristen, thank you for your service to our city. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and for the culture and approach uh, that you've helped build on this commission during your tenure here. So um, thank you so much. We owe you a lot. Um, and to the commissioners, thank you for your excellent work, your deep dedication. It's very, it's coming through in your presentation and your work. I, there's a lot of love there um, and care. Um, and thank you for caring about what makes Portland, Portland. 
So very happy to vote aye. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you for a comprehensive report. This has been a rich day, and somehow they all connect. It's, it's been a long day, but it's, 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 it's been a rich day. Um, certainly want to hi highlight some of the economic drivers that will help preserve and protect. Um, not, don't necessarily uh, need to echo every part of uh, Commissioner Rubio's points, but uh, am intrigued by the Seattle model of sticks with carrots. You know, that's always the issue here when we're talking about URMs, uh, and I think that's something we, we need to keep in mind. It's a, both a huge opportunity and a huge challenge for the city of Portland, how we uh, preserve that feel of the city, uh, particularly in certain neighborhoods, but uh, also address the real seismic risk we're, we're facing as a community um, and find a way to build more affordable housing uh, and tying it all together. So um, the seismic upgrade credits, again, I just think we all need to keep that in focus. Um, I love the emphasis on cultural icons as in addition to architectural ones. I think you very well said. and. Um, I will uh, also uh, build off of uh, Ms. Ram's comments about potential on monuments being not just exclusive but inclusive. Can we preserve some of our history but also bring new voices and new faces? Uh, can we do that simultaneously? And that's, that's a challenge for our community. How do we do both to preserve what was beautiful about our past and also recognize that certain voices were excluded and bring them to the front or, uh, at the same time? I'm not sure we've struck the right balance as a community on this very difficult topic, but I look forward to partnering with you all in the future on how we might do that. And obviously I geeked out on the library project. With that, <laughs> I vote aye. Thank you. Ryan? Yeah, I think we've all been geeking out in a good way uh, this afternoon. I think combining the design commission then with historical landmarks, it's, uh, I, I, I have trouble sometimes detangling them, and maybe it's because I'm not supposed to. So it's by design that you are going back to back this afternoon. And then it just so happens we had you know wonderful dialogue today about how to convert uh, business uh, office buildings into housing, as we talked about earlier. So it has been a really long day, but it's been, uh, sometimes we have long days where you're just staring at the clock and you're really hoping it ends soon. But this has been really exciting. It's been, um, <laughs> and I think every time I would meet with the historic uh, group, I would always end up going over. I remember my staff always telling me, knock it off. And it's, um, and I'm going to blame you a little bit, Kristen Miner, because we'd always get into a conversation that just uncovers layers and layers that goes well beyond what the scope of the original conversation was. And I think when you came up to talk about the Albina Library, and then we did geek out on libraries, it, it was yet another opportunity to have some authentic dialogue about how the world's changing. I was in New York like 20 years ago whenever the big library in New York was redone, and I had a friend who was an architect on that project. There were quite a few. And again, this was at least 20 years ago, but they're like, what's different about the library? And I'm like, well, it's not, I don't feel like someone's gonna tell me to like shut up, like it doesn't feel like it's a cathedral, it's a church. And and then I go, oh, it's a, I'll do this. Like I don't hear pages moving, but you hear the tick, 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 you know, people on, so it's like even that sound. And you know there's certain conversations you'll never forget, that was one of them. And then since then, <clears throat> working with schools and families, especially out in East County, you would just see the nest, how necessary it was to have the library up and running. I mean, the COVID lockdown with our schools and our libraries for a while was just so devastating on children and families. And I really noticed that when it came to that combination of them both being shut down for a while, just how nervous I was about what was happening with our children's learning loss. And uh, so anyway, I'm really grateful that we're here today. These projects are exciting. Your report was amazing. And uh, I, I kind of wish every city council meeting had these kind of conversations. Um, but together, we have to keep figuring this out. It's always going to be messy. Congratulations, Kaya. Um, tomorrow's a big day for you all and for the community in general. Thanks for telling me that story about the swing dancing, you said? Mm -hmm. All right, that's pretty cool. Is that at 11? 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock swing dancing. Professional. It'll end at um, Barnes & Morgan, the new tea shop that's in the neighborhood. Are there lessons, or you just have to wing it? What's that? Are there lessons, or you just have to wing it? Uh, the, you're just going to have to join in, but the music will just start you swinging. Yeah. Cool. All right. Love it. Those who dance together, stay together. All right. I vote aye. Oh, wait. Before you end, uh, Andrew and I just want to thank uh, 
we're very grateful for the competent staff that we have supporting the, the Historic Longmont Commission. We just want to especially thank Hillary Adams for all of her support and um, time with the Historic Longmont Commission. We love you, Hillary. Now oh, there she is. Ah, so <laughs> modest. <laughs> Yay. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. All right. I vote aye. And it's been approved. The report's been approved. Yes. Accepted. That's the term. Got it. Okay. Now we'll go on to our next item. Thank you so much for being here. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. There's so many happy people in here right now. We can we can we like freeze this moment? Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to tell the mayor and Mingus Maps. Yeah. It's all there. Aria, go ahead and read the next item. Item 224, deny Blaine A. West and Teresa West's application for special assessment of open space land at 10615 Southwest 42nd Avenue. Okay, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, colleagues, today we are holding a hearing on a request by a property owner to have their property taxes deferred through a state provision Called the, land, or called the Special Assessment of Open Space Land Request. Staff from the Bureau of Planning um, and Sustainability will present the ordinance and findings. So welcome, Sandra Wood. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Sandra Wood. I'm with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and I'm accompanied today remotely by two of my colleagues, Shannon Buno, who's a senior planner at BPS, and Stephanie Beckman, who is with the Bureau of Development Services in the Land Division um, Land Use Review section. Um, we are here to have a public hearing on an ordinance um, to deny a special assessment of open space land for a property at 10615 Southwest 42nd Avenue. This is um, not the type of project that we usually do, so I just wanted to um, mention that. Um, it's not a legislative project that affects many properties. Rather, it's an application that affects um, one property and one property only. Um, I wanted to take a moment to explain why the Portland City Council is um, involved in a tax assessment request because, as I said, many of us um, haven't done this in the past. Um, um, I wanted to thank also um, Lauren King, who has been guiding us, our city attorney, through this process. Um, the Oregon State Statutes, which are the rules of um, the, the state of Oregon, allows property owners to apply for special tax assessments to defer their property taxes. One of those special assessments is for open space. The intent of the open space assessment is to maintain, conserve, and preserve open space land. On December 30th, 2022, the property owners Blaine and Teresa West applied for a special assessment for open space land for their property at 10615 Southwest 42nd Avenue. The statutes require that the local jurisdiction, in this case, the Portland City Council, approve or disapprove the application, and that council notify the county assessor of your decision by April 1st of this year. So if council doesn't make a decision by April 1st, the application is automatically improved by, approved by Multnomah County. Um, so I'll pass it on to my colleague, Shannon Buno. She's going to describe the specifics of, um, of the proposal. Thank you, Sandra. Hi, Shannon. Hi, thank you very much. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, thanks. So the West property is roughly um, 2.4 acre tax lot located in Southwest Portland. It's highlighted in red on the slide. Um, it's between Southwest Capitol Highway and Jackson Middle School, if you're familiar with Southwest Portland. 
The lot is zoned residential. The property is not zoned open space and it is not designated as open space in the city's comprehensive plan. The property also has environmental conservation and in constrained sites overlay zones. That's the small C and the small Z after the R7 in the zoning. The property's present use is residential and it is developed with a house and an accessory dwelling unit. Um, next slide, please. The property is large enough to be divided into additional lots. In 2007, a former owner applied for a land division to divide the property into 12 new lots. This is a tentative um, plan, plat of that uh, uh, subdivision. The proposal was recommended for approval, but was withdrawn by the applicant before final decision. So it, it, it was never finalized. Next slide. The open space assessment statutes list four factors that must be weighed in deciding to approve or disapprove an application for the special assessment. Um, I, I'll briefly walk you through each factor and um, summarize our recommended finding for that. The first factor to consider relates to the cost of extending urban services to the affected lot or parcel. So regarding factor one, we conclude that there are no protect projected costs of extending urban services to the lot. The property currently has access to urban services such as water, sanitary sewer, police and fire protection, mass transit, and schools. The second factor relates to the value of preserving the lot as open space. Um, in this case, we find the value of this particular lot lies in its residential designation rather than as open space. The property is not currently in an open space use and it is not designated as open space in the comprehensive plan, so there's no intention for it to become a park um, at any point in the future. The comprehensive plan guides how and where land is developed and it was updated within the past five years. The plan balances the need for housing and jobs and the need for open space and natural areas. In this case, the property is part of the supply of residential land designated to address the housing needs um, of the city over the coming years. Um, next slide, please. The third factor has to do with the cost of extending urban services beyond the lot. As with the first factor, there are no projected costs of extending urban services beyond the property because urban services already exist to and beyond the property. And the fourth factor relates to the cost of expanding the urban growth boundary to compensate for any reduction in available buildable land as a result of approval of an open space assessment. Approval of this particular open space assessment will reduce the supply of buildable land for residential use in the city. However, it is unknown whether that reduction would directly trigger an expansion of the urban growth boundary. But a reduction in buildable land opportunities will further constrain housing options in the city at a time when the need for housing has significantly surpassed the supply and a housing emergency has been declared. And on the next slide. Therefore, after weighing the factors and considering the fact that the property is zoned residential and is being used residentially, and in the light of the current housing crisis, staff recommends that this application for a special assessment of open space land be denied. Voting in favor of this ordinance will disapprove the application. Thank you very much for your attention to this matter, and we're happy to answer any questions before or after the public testimony. Thank you so much, Shannon. Is there any public testimony on this item? No one signed up. Okay. Uh, I will ask that we'll go ahead and close oral and written record at this time. Yes? Lauren? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Sandra, you didn't have any communication with the applicant to think that they... We have been communicating with the applicant all along and sending them the documents and letting them know that today was a public hearing and they got a copy of the notice. Um, so, so they elected not to. They elected not to attend. So we can go ahead and close the, the record. I appreciate you putting that dialogue into the, into the public record. And so now we can go ahead and close the oral and written record. Um, council members, any questions, discussions for Sandra? I only had only one. Yeah. Just can you explain the second factor 
Uh, I just didn't quite follow that, and I wanted to make sure I understood which factor cuts in favor of granting or not, just the way it was. Yeah, framed. so the second factor was the value of preserving the lot or parcel as open space. Of course, we here in Oregon, we love our open space, and we definitely love our open spaces in cities, but there's a balance also. This property is residentially zoned, so it's planned to be um, developed with um, residential units on it. Um, as, and as Shannon stated, there's a house with an accessory dwelling unit on it. There's actually three parks in the close vicinity. Um, Jackson Middle School school is there, Lal, um, I just want to look at the ordinance, yeah, Wildwood. Um, Lal Wildwood Natural Area and Holly um, Farm Park, they're all within a quarter or half a mile from this property, um, so it, it, you know, it's not deficient in, in parkland. Got it, and, I, and I, I guess I was just struggling with the way it's framed here, but I, when you draw the conclusion, the property, the value of the property is as residential, you're saying as communal benefit, it's more important that it is residential as opposed to open space given the close proximity to other parks. Exactly, and it factors into our buildable lands inventory of what properties we expect to be developing in the next you know, 20 year horizon, and this is one of those properties because it can be, um, as the preliminary plat from the previous owner showed, it can be divided into more dwelling units. Okay, that answers my questions. Thank you. Nope. Okay, as I understand it, this is a non-emergency item. Is it that same category, correct? And would go to a second reading on March 22nd? It is. You can add an emergency clause if you wanted to, but otherwise it's a non-emergency item and we can roll it to the fourth. No. Can we do that? Sorry, no, you can't, you don't have I didn't think so. I was, you, I was, we need the council clerk. <laughs> Thank you. We always need the council clerk. Uh, thank you. Yes, you can add an emergency clause. Yes, so just. We all got a little excited. Okay. No, all right. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this will now move on to a second reading for March 22nd. And with that, this ends our afternoon session. We're now adjourned. Thank you. Re